low-density single-family to Colonial Williamsburg support, and that is shown in the light blue area uh, on the map. In addition, an amendment is proposed to the text of Chapter 8 in the Comprehensive Plan, Neighborhoods and Housing. The proposed change of the 46 acres shown in blue to Colonial Williamsburg support removes 21 net acres of developable residential land along South England Street, reducing the estimated yield from 127 to 64 houses. The proposed Colonial Williamsburg support designation for this area is similar to and consistent with the same designation for the Colonial Williamsburg Nursery on Quarter Path Road, the Colonial Williamsburg Distribution Warehouse on Fifth Avenue, and the bus maintenance facility on Pocahontas Trail. The proposed musket range is consistent with the definition for Colonial Williamsburg support land use since it is a use that supports the function of the Colonial Williamsburg Historic District. Moving on to the zoning uh, part of the request, uh, again as part of this proposal, it's proposed to amend the text of the Museum Support District to add shooting ranges for authentic and or replica 18th century firearms as a special use permit use in the Museum Support District. Uh, this is in the same category as many of the existing support district, support facility uses now listed. The third case is a rezoning and it's proposed to rezone the 46 acres uh, that are proposed to be redesignated in the comprehensive plan to museum support district. MS, the current zoning is RS1, uh, single family district. Uh, the comprehensive plan changes support this rezoning amendment. Uh, staff was concerned with the range of uses allowed by right in the museum support district and the fact that this property is now served only by South England Street, a narrow private street in this area. To address this concern, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation has proffered that the only uses allowed by the rezoning will be shooting ranges for authentic and or replica 18th century firearms and or passive open space. These proffered restrictions satisfy staff's return, staff's concerns. The amendment of the comprehensive plan coupled with the zoning changes that I just reviewed gives the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation the ability to apply for a special use permit for the proposed musket range. The details of the uh, requested special use permit will now be reviewed by Deputy Planning Director Carolyn Murphy. The proposed musket range will consist of an open pole structure for the shooting area containing six stations, a storage building with a screen, portable toilet, and two parking spaces. This is uh, a picture of what the uh, proposed structure will look like. The Architectural Review Board approved the design of the proposed buildings and structures at their meeting on July the 14th. A U-shaped 10 by 20 foot berm will extend from the shooting area to behind the target area, and the berm is shown here in green. The musket range area will be enclosed with an eight foot fence, chain link and wooden, and the fence will be uh, wooden along uh, South England Street on this side and this side, and chain link on the back side and the back side of the berm. <laughs> Guests will be transported from the Williamsburg Lodge to the site where they will be given instructions by certified range officers, one instructor for every two guests. Once fired, the range officer will reload and the guests will repeat the firing until the end of the educational experience. 18th century firearms are being considered for use are the brown vest, smooth bore musket, civilian rifle bore gun, and the blunderbuss. After completion, guests will be driven back to the Williamsburg Lodge. The proposed hours of operation are daily from 9 to 4. A noise study was conducted by Acoustical Solutions at four sites shown on this uh, slide. And you can see uh, site one was across the street 
at the golf course. Site two was at the end of Port Ann. Site three was at the, the Oaks, and site four was along the park service. Three, three shots were fired at each of the sites with only one of the 12 rounds exceeding the 65 decibel level, levels, with the loudest shot being 67 at test site one, which is the green course golf course across the street from the musket range. <coughs> The maximum noise level allowed by the city's noise control ordinance is 65 decibels from 7 to 11. However, the lawful discharge of firearms is exempt from the city's noise control ordinance. The proposed musket range offers a hands-on experience for guests to not only shoot 18th century weapons, but to learn about the role of 18th century firearms in American life. As a supporting activity, the musket range helps to maintain the unique character and historical importance of the Colonial Williamsburg Historic Area. Planning Commission held a public hearing on July the 15th, and one applicant and one citizen spoke at the hearing. <coughs> Planning Commission recommends to City Council by a vote of 402 that the four cases be approved. PCR 15-14, approved proposed ordinance 1515 to amend the 2013 comp plan. PCR 1515, approved proposed ordinance 1516 to amend the museum support district by adding shooting ranges for authentic and a replica 18th century firearms as a special use permit. PCR 1516, approved proposed ordinance 1517 to rezone approximately 46 acres on a portion of 640 South England Street. And PCR 1517 approved the special use permit request to construct a shooting range for authentic and or replica 18th century firearms at 640 South England Street contingent upon the operation of this facility being in accordance with the musket firing range operations plan dated May the 20th, 2015. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Reading I, the representatives are from Colonial Williamsburg are also here and I'm sure they'll speak at the public. Carolyn, thank you. Reed, thank you very much. Uh, let me just comment that uh, the quality of this proposal, both with the staff work that went into it as well as the work from Colonial Williamsburg, uh, uh, is, is top notch. So thank you all for the hard work that went into this. Let me turn to council for any uh, questions or comments before I open the public meeting. Mr. Mayor, as an employee of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, I will refrain from discussing this matter and abstain from voting on it. Any, any questions for staff before I open the public? Go ahead. We're traditional. Did I show you off? <laughs> I'm, I'm so used to not talking first. Uh, <laughs> just to be clear, this is seven days a week. That's correct. Okay. Um, with regard to noise, was there any consideration of, of measures that could be put in place that would help muffle noise even further? Uh, well, that's higher the, berm or right. there was no basically a very little berm in the very beginning so after that uh, this is when the berm came in and the berm is uh, 10 feet basically on the sides with t going down to 20 feet at the at the rear so it was a concern with the police department so the foundation took that concern in, into consideration and ended up doing this berm around the site to help not only with the noise but to help with the the firing of the weapons also to be yes. safer. So the results of this, the test were prior to the room, obviously. Right. Okay. So it, it would only be less than noise. Yeah. May I follow up on that? So, um, you talked about the wooden fence on the sort of the, the I guess the this side. east sides. Mm -hmm. um, will will that have sound deadening aspects to it as as well? Uh, at current, it's just a wooden fence. The foundation may be able to address that more with, okay. with their comments. But Thank it's my you. understanding it's a wooden fence on this side and this side with a chain link chain. on the back portions. Okay. Thanks. One of the questions we got um, from citizens had to do with the fact that the noise study was done in the summer and the trees are in leaf. And is there any difference in the winter? Thank you. I'm not a noise study person, but I would assume that with the leaves off the trees, the noise might be a, a slight bit more. But uh, being, I actually rode with the foundation to all the four test sites and witnessed the uh, the firing of the weapons. And at the site number one, which was the golf course, and I think it's maybe hole number nine. I don't play <laughs> golf, 
uh, we actually waited until uh, some gentlemen were getting ready to swing and hit the ball and I actually had them shoot the musket doing that and they didn't even flinch. I mean, they hit the ball and went on about their business. Uh, so I think there might be some difference, but I don't think it would be that much. Any, any other questions before I open? Go back to the previous slide. Those circular sketches there, are those existing trees or proposed trees? What, what, are, the, what are those? Those, these are trees. I guess you're talking about these? Yeah, yeah. I think they're just showing trees on the site plan. Okay. They're existing. It's, it's a heavily wooded area. Gotcha. Uh, there's a little road that's, you can see there, close to where I put the green sign. So it's back in that area. And it was further back, and they pulled it up a little bit. The one thing that I would note is that the, Colonial, the uh, National Park Service uh, received their request, and they're in favor of it. So. That was one of the initial staff comments. And any other questions before I open the public hearing? Again, Carolyn Reed, thank, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'll open the public hearing and ask anyone who wishes to speak to this to please come forward and state your name and address. Good afternoon, Mayor Hallman, members of council. I'm Ron Kirkman from the Williamsburg Hotel Motel Association. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The topic of guns in our country can sometimes be one of great debate and emotion. And although I may not be an expert on firearms as a decorated combat veteran, I've fired at and been fired upon by the enemy. I don't say that to be flippant about this issue, but to relate to you that I have a close up and personal understanding of the seriousness of the topic. As we rev reviewed Colonial Williamsburg's request to operate a musket range, we took into consideration five things. Safety, responsibility, noise, benefit to the community, and benefit to tourism. On safety, we have no doubt that uh, lawyers have gone through this with a fine tooth comb, and the operation and site plan are detailed, thoughtfully presented, and we're very comfortable this will be a safe environment for this type of activity. Responsibility, uh, as we read through the documents, the thing that stood out over and again was that safety is the number one priority. And when dealing with firearms, there's nothing more responsible than teaching safety and respect. Uh, as far as responsibility, CW seems to have the right mindset. Noise, the noise report seems to relegate this as a non-issue. Uh, I, I took a look at some different noise level charts. And for people that are more than 100 feet away, uh, lawnmowers, vacuum cleaners, and cars are going to make more noise than, than what this is going to generate. Benefit to the community. Anytime Colonial Williamsburg adds a new activity, it's a benefit to the community. If nothing else, local young people and old alike will have the opportunity to learn more about firearms from qualified instructors in a safe and unique environment. This doesn't take into account the potential for additional tax revenue, which helps keep local taxes low and helps everyone. Benefit to tourism. Adding more interactive and unique experiences, such as the Musket Range, can do nothing but help tourism. In my mind, this is akin to adding a roller coaster or a new museum exhibit. When the tourist has more to do, they want to stay longer. The longer they stay, the more they spend, and the more taxes the city collects. If they have a really good time, they want to come back and bring their friends. And we need more people staying with us longer and more often. After considering these five things, we cannot think of a reason not to support the Musket Range. Some really nice and good people may have an aversion to guns, and I understand that. For those that feel that way, I'd ask you this. Would we rather have our kids and non-gun-owning adults sitting in living rooms pretending to shoot people in a video game? Or actually teach them firsthand about the history, power, and responsibility of guns in the United States? I can tell you my children are well-trained with a firearm, and they have zero interest in shoot -em up games or Warcraft games. And I think it's because they have a good understanding of the real thing. I think more people taking part in this opportunity is a good thing, and what better way to do so than through demonstrating how to safely and properly use the very weapons that help bring freedom to these United States. Regardless of personal feelings about guns, I would ask that you support Colonial Williamsburg request to open and operate a musket range. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirkham. Next. Frederick J. Toyda, 511 Newport Avenue, Williamsburg, the city. 
I'm also editor of publications at the Omaha Hundred Institute of Early American History and Culture, so I bring an understanding, a fair amount, about 18th century history. Um, it's on that basis I would like to speak. The primary rationale offered by Colonial Williamsburg Foundation for the creation of shooting range within the city is an economic one, to address shrinking attendance and its financial impact. The opportunity to fire 18th century firearms is one of CW's initiatives to attract more visitors. While we all recognize the economic pressures from declining tourism in this town, I do not think we should take that as sufficient justification alone for creating an, quote, 18th century musket firing range experience. Although the CW plan mentions, quote, an immersive education about the role of firearms in 18th century American life, the documentation provided only focuses on instructing guests in the construction and specific uses of an assortment of replica firearms, concluding with the experience of shooting them at a target. As a member of this community, I would like to hear a more thoughtful in-depth educational plan to accompany the proposal for setting up a target range. How will historical interpreters at CW educate would be shooters by framing the uses of firearms within the historical context of 18th century Virginia? What was the availability of guns? How was their accuracy? How widespread the ownership? What restrictions placed on ownership? Fears of restive white indentured servants, alienated Indians, insurrection, insurrectionary, or the fear of insurrectionary, enslaved Africans motivated many statutes concerning guns in colonial Virginia. Quote from Henning's statute, no Negro, mulatto, or Indian whatsoever shall keep or carry any gun, and every such offender shall receive lashes not to exceed 39 on his or her bare back. Embedding firearms in historical circumstances involving not just food and defense, but fear and class and racial violence would give guests truly meaningful insight into shooting a musket. Finally, the idea that shooting each weapon a few times is going to provide guests with, quote, a safe and enjoyable experience is chilling. In the context of this year's events, safe as an open invitation to deranged individuals to come shoot, not at the markets, but at tourists waiting their turn, enjoyable with the memory of recent killings of people in church and sitting in movie theaters? Instead, could not this initiative be turned to a more serious instructional purpose? Interpreters by immersing visitors in the history surrounding ownership and use of firearms in 18th century Virginia could provide guests with critical tools for thinking about the multiple ramifications and of guns in the 21st century. Guns are not fetishes. They do not have the power to aim and shoot on their own. It requires a person to do that. And I hope the CW will prepare guests for handling guns by inculcating a seriousness and respect for these weapons and a due appreciation of the purposes to which they were put in 18th century Virginia. In conclusion, inviting visitors to Williamsburg to shoot 18th century weapons seems to me to be a loaded proposition that requires further reflection from CW leaders and staff and from you, our representatives of this historic city. I believe the reputation, both of the city and Colonial Williamsburg, requires such due consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Toyda. Thanks. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Andrew Langer. Uh, I am a Williamsburg resident at uh, 2484 Sanctuary Drive in Williamsburg, Virginia. I'm a, a relative uh, uh, return uh, to Williamsburg. I was a student at William & Mary. I moved back here a year ago. And in my day job, I run a group out of D.C. called the Institute for Liberty, which is a group focused generally on federal public policy. And as such, I spend a lot of time talking on the radio to people all around the country. And in the last year, when I've told folks that I've moved back to Williamsburg, uh, almost to a person they get excited and they ask me about things that are happening in Williamsburg and I become sort of an informal ambassador for Colonial Williamsburg and the other uh, attractions here to bring people into town. Uh, about six weeks ago, I, I was uh, on an interview and the host asked me specifically about this proposal, very enthusiastic about this proposal. And I actually at that point didn't know about it and I read up a little bit further and talked to him about it. 
and, and since then, I've had a number of other conversations with talk radio hosts around the country uh, who are all very excited about this possibility, and their listeners are very excited about this possibility. Uh, I think this is an excellent idea. Uh, I think in terms of uh, attracting more and more people, I, and I want to commend the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation uh, for the efforts that they've made, especially in the last 18 months, to attract more people uh, to Colonial Williamsburg with a, wide ver with a wide range of immersive and educational experiences. Uh, this one especially, uh, given the, the uh, audience that Colonial Williamsburg goes after, the kind of people who come to visit Colonial Williamsburg, this is an added value. Many of them are already familiar with the history of firearms, uh, the use of firearms, restrictions on firearms in colonial times, but want that extra added immersive experience that something like this offers. So I have, uh, I voice enthusiastic support, and I look forward to uh, uh, hearing your vote. Thank you. Mr. Langer, thank you very much, and welcome back as a former sir. student. It's Please nice sir. to see you back in Williamsburg. Good to see you, sir. Yes. Hi, I'm Robert Underwood. I'm a representative from Colonia Williamsburg. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, and council members. Uh, over the past decade, Colonia Williamsburg's visitation has declined significantly, impacting the foundation and local businesses in the community. In an effort to reverse this trend, the foundation is implementing new initiatives to draw new guests to the area and improve guest experience and enticing longer stays, providing unique experiences, attractions that draw guests to Williamsburg are critical to the financial health and well-being of the foundation and our community. This is especially true in today's competitive market for people's vacation time and discretionary income. The 18th century musket range experience is intended to be both an engaging guest attraction and an immersive education about the role of firearms in the 18th century American life, and that is our intent. We will be, it will be a natural extension of two existing offerings in the historic area, the Revolutionary City reenactment programs and the trades that are practiced and interpreted at the blacksmith and the gunsmith shops. It is critical that Colonial Williamsburg turns around the declining visitation trend by offering new attractions and programming for the sake of the foundation, local businesses, and the community. I ask that you approve the initiative in, in support of the efforts to increase visitation and to support the impact it will have on the local economy and our community. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Would anyone else wish to address this issue? Uh, my name's Mark Everett. I'm from, I live in Port Anne. Um, uh, I used to belong to a gun club myself. And I know how far the sound travels on these uh, from reports of particularly muskets and, and shotguns. Uh, I live approximately 2,500, maybe 3,000 feet from the site. Um, I can guarantee you, I'll be hearing it. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to rain on a parade here because I can see everybody done a lot of work putting this thing together. But at the same time, um, I, I'm a little worried about what will we run into if it turns out that the sound is actually obtrusive to the extent that, you know, somebody wants to buy my house and the guns go off, I say, well, what the heck was that? And say, so, oh, it's a firing range over there. Well, they only do it seven days a week. Um, I think uh, um, I'm a little concerned about the, the noise level is going to be higher than people anticipate. And I'm not concerned about safety because I think people have done considerable planning on that. I'm not concerned about the the uh, economic impact, but I do 
I am concerned about the noise and, and how high that's going to be. So my question to you all is what recourse will we have that is the communities around us, the Oaks and Big Button Down, Henry, uh, Henry Street and uh, um, a, uh, England Street, what recourse will we have if this becomes oppressive or uh, annoying uh, to the extent that uh, um, we feel we should do something? Thank you very much. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor, Council Members, uh, I'm Dean Canavis. I own the Capital Pancake House. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for wearing, wearing my alma mater in William Mary's territory. Uh, I am a proud graduate, also of graduate school at William Mary, so I, I can't I can't lose when they play football together. <laughs> um, getting back to topic, um, I have a unique perspective uh, at the Capital Pancake House. I see mainly my customers are locals, but I see a good fair of a fair share of uh, the visitors in town. And uh, one of the things when this first came out in the public, in the media, uh, I was talking to a number of my guests, out of town and locals. And one of the things that over the years that uh, a lot of us in the restaurant business and the hotel business, we've been pushing for Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg in particular, to revamp itself, to make it more exciting. One of the things that we lost years ago was the family. Mom and dad, two kids, and Fido the dog. Why don't they come to Williamsburg anymore? They don't come like they used to. The numbers speak for themselves. And I applaud Colonel Williamsburg for taking bold moves to come up with these initiatives. I've heard some other initiatives also are in the works uh, to try to bring the families back. Uh, when I go and speak to a, a family uh, with children at the table and I tell them about things that are happening so they know for next time if they ever plan another vacation, one of the things statistics will tell you is the mother typically makes a decision uh, where the kids or where the family is going to vacation. One of the biggest problems um, I think we've had is children today, as those of you who have young children, um, I've got two, one in freshman in college, just finished his freshman year, one that's just graduated college last year. And one of the things that I've realized when they were going through high school is everyone is fighting for that competitive edge. Children today don't get out of school in May or June and have the summer off anymore. They are working all the way through summer. They have a reading list they've got to complete before the start of school session in the end of August or 1st of September. They've got all kinds of different types of work with AP classes they're going to be taken or have taken that they've got to complete or tests they've got to take. So children are working even through the summer. One of the things that um, if you read some of the studies, mothers who make majority decisions with a family vacation um, talk about is when they go on vacation, they want to be on vacation. And although it's a plus to learn the historical significance of Colonial Williamsburg, they also want to make a have, have a chance where the children have fun. Again, when I walk up to the table, to just give you a, a, my own perspective, my unique perspective, when I mention this shooting range of muskets, of course, these are children now that are walking to my restaurant, and occasionally we sell, depending on when the, we restock, the tricorder hats, uh, we used to sell small little muskets, that little poppers. Sometimes they do it in the dining room that aggravates everybody, but uh, they, they're a big seller. But when you talk to these families with young children, that the possibility of having a musket range nearby where Florida Williamsburg would be showing them not only the historical significance of, of firearms in the, in the era, but also the chance of being able to fire one, their eyes light up. Again, we want to go after those families to bring them back. Those are the ones that made Williamsburg what it was. Those are the ones that had the numbers in terms of attendance up to where they should be, and those are the ones we want to get back. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Yes. Um, my name is Neil Elwine. I'm with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. I wanted to provide a little bit more information about the sound and the sound test that we did. And it might be helpful if we could put the one slide up that had the uh, four test sites. Thank you, Carolyn. 
So the data that we had, uh, Acoustical Solutions out of Richmond, Virginia, was our consultant that did our work for us on this, and I think uh, many of us have copies of the report that they did, but I just wanted to kind of summarize the, uh, the key points. The closest site from the shooting location was, was test site number one, and that was the uh, Green Course number nine tee box. And uh, that uh, location was 500 feet, approximately 500 feet. The distances that I'm talking about, I got actually off of the uh, city of Williamsburg's property information system, which provides a really nice tool. You can take as the crow flies, if you will, um, and draw a line between two points, and it tells you the distance. And that's where these distances came from. So that, that 500 feet was where we uh, measured 67 decibels on the day that we uh, took the readings in June. Um, as Carolyn said, you know, this was a kind of a litmus test, if you will, and that we had golfers coming around. We had an important golf event that morning, and as the folks approached the tee box and got up there on their backswings and etc., for you golfers, you all know how quiet everyone is when there's somebody on the tee box. And, uh, you know, I'm on the little radio telling the guy to, to shoot the musket. And to, to my surprise, actually, when the musket fired, no, nobody in the foursome flinched. Nobody in the foursome even, you know, turned to look. I mean, it was, it was a quite muted sound. Uh, 67 decibels um, isn't really that loud. The next location, <coughs> the next closest location would be test site four. That location along the parkway was about 1,000 feet from the shooting site. 1,080 is actually what it came off to. That, that uh, sound level was 60 decibels there. We had the sound consultant. We had to wait a lot because there was traffic that uh, at that time. And of course, the traffic noise was higher than you know, we, we had to get the background noise down so that we could measure the noise of the musket going off, if you will. So it, it took some time at that site waiting until it was quiet enough to say shoot the musket, and, and then we recorded 60 decibels. The next closest location was the Oaks. Uh, subdivision, and we went to the uh, to the end of the uh, subdivision, closest to the test site. Uh, I was coming up with uh, 1,820 feet from the shooting site to that location. Um, there too, um, well, there it was nice and quiet. There wasn't much going on. There wasn't anybody at home that time of day, so it was a quiet setting. We recorded 46 decibels. 46 decibels. You know, you would really have to pay attention in order to hear that the shot went off. At 46 decibels, you know, you've got noises around you, birds chirping this, that, and the other, and 46 decibels is a very low level. And then our farthest site was over at test site two, which is in the, the coves subdivision. And I picked what I thought would be the next closest subdivision to the test shooting site. That one actually uh, came in at about 3,900 feet from the shooting location to that test site. And we had, with, uh, you know, um, cell phones, we shot probably three, four, five times. That we just simply couldn't hear it. It was inaudible. Um, the meter wouldn't pick it up, and neither would the human ear. Uh, since doing this test, I did go back to the consultants and say, well, what would be the effect of constructing the berm around the uh, shooting site? And they came back with the uh, calculation that the, the nearest site, which is the golf course location, should experience a six decibel reduction uh, due to the 10-foot berm around the sides of the uh, shooting site, um, principally. And um, so that would take us from 67 down to an estimated 61 decibels. Um, so you know, I hope that helps to give a little more insight to it. The, uh, the question raised about the, the winter time, summer time foliage on the tree question, the consultants couldn't really give a specific answer on that because there hasn't been really any specific studies done as, as he understood it on that kind of a thing. Um, he did make the comment if you, if you cleared the woods entirely between the shooting location and the uh, uh, green course number nine tee box, that 500 foot distance, he suggested that if that was a clear opening, it would increase the, the decibel level by five decibels. So, um, but considering that we're not doing that. He said that the thing that is, even when trees lose their leaves, there's still a lot of tree, uh, there's still a lot of interference in there. You have a lot of standing uh, trees, trunks, et cetera, vines, and et cetera. So there's, there's no real clear cut answer on that. But I think uh, uh, I feel very good about the data that we got that uh, the neighborhoods uh, won't feel uh, an impact. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. I'm a James City Council. No, I'm sorry. Could you please come to the podium and, and state your name and address? Uh, 
I'm Lynn Zeller. I live in James City County in Kingsmill. Do I have a right to say anything here? Of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, was the test done with just one musket at a time? Because if there are multiple guns being shot at one time, then that's another noise level. Um, I live on um, in Wareham's Point in Kingsmill, and so I am close to the factory at Anheuser-Busch, and I love to have fresh air in my windows open. I can tell you that I can hear the factory much more in the winter than I can in the summer, probably a third to a fourth as much noise level increase. So I think foliage does have something to do with the noise, noise level. And um, also for um, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, I'm also an ex-mortgage banker, so I'm always thinking about that residential tax revenue for housing. Has anyone done a study as to the cost that Colonial Williamsburg, the foundation, is going to have as an outlay versus how many guests do we need to pay for our payback to investment for this um, new thing, um, endeavor? I can't say that I'm for it. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to address this issue? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and come back to council for discussion and action. Mr. Foster. Question for Chris and maybe for staff as well. Um, assuming we approve this and everything goes well for a while, it later becomes a, a nuisance to certain residents, what recourse do we have? If Other than Colonial Williamsburg's goodwill. If, if you want to include conditions in the special use permit, you can do that. They need to be reasonable conditions regarding the use of the property. Good. But may I interrupt? Sure. Could, could those conditions be an annual or biannual report on noise back to city? And, and if we found a problem, once the special use permit is offered, is there a way to take it back? I guess I, I don't. I don't know what. You can make the special use permit for a period of time. Time. Okay. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. So, so we might make it for two years or four years, some time period, and then, then, then at that point, we would have some real experience and be able to judge. Yes. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Scott, you can, you can come back to me if I have something else. Okay. But, um, I guess a, a question uh, from me with CW staff members about um, the amount of load that goes into the black powder gun. Can that, is that an adjustable amount, and does that have any effect on noise? Um, it actually does, and we have uh, done different trials, and we are looking at reducing the charges in, in the uh, in the weapon itself. Okay. Okay. Well, just, and so my comment would be, um, you know, um, I think we keep talking about history being boring and, and it's being harder to sell Williamsburg because of that. Um, and, and I'd only be repeating what some people have already said, but finding new ways to be interactive, um, to, to let the visitors experience hands-on, um, you know, this aspect of history I think is beneficial both to the visitor, to Colonel Williamsburg, and just future generations. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that tangible um, aspect of, of, of vacation that I think people uh, look for and that we have struggled to present to Colonel Williamsburg in the area. And I think Colonel Williamsburg is, is coming a long way in trying to make it more interactive. Um, you know, what better way to get, you know, kids and families to put down their cell phones for a period of time and, and touch history and be a part of it. And, um, and, and so if there is an increase in visitation, uh, then, then we're all the beneficiaries of that. Um, you know, and I've asked many questions of Clinton Williamsburg over the years, um, but I don't think I've ever had a question or question their ability to represent history accurately. Um, um, professionally, uh, I've always had great confidence that they, they can do that, and I think that that's what's going to happen uh, with this musket range as well. Um, you know, I'd be open-minded to um, some, some review dates if, 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 if the majority of council wants to do that. Um, 
but with that said, I'm also very confident that as as this evolves, Colonial Williamsburg will be very responsive to, you know, how much puts the grain load in, in the muskets to help dampen noise. Could they put, you know, an additional ivy fence up and help dampen noise? I think I think they'll go through those those iterations to help make sure um, that it's it's as non offensive as it as it can be given the uh, sensitivities to it. So um, uh, I'm looking forward to supporting this. Judy. Um, I'm also looking forward to supporting it. And originally I had written down two objections uh, that people have brought up. The third mm -hmm. one now is the change in the zoning from residential. And um, I, two things about that. For the most part, if you run the numbers, houses cost a jurisdiction money. They don't bring in, they cost more in services than they bring in in tax revenue. And so that, that I'm not in favor of a whole lot more residential use around Colonial Williamsburg. I also like the idea of, of more trees around Colonial Williamsburg, more open space around Colonial Williamsburg. So I don't think that the, the land use, that's not an issue for me. The other issue was noise, and um, I think that's been well answered. The noise, the noise problem seems to be under control. The third issue then is guns, and um, one of my observations over the course of the arguments in this country about gun control are what I see as a real misunderstanding of the Second Amendment to the Constitution. And one of Colonial Williamsburg's real strengths is being able to talk about what the founders said and put it in context. So maybe we can work on a, I, I agree with the speaker who talked about the need for more education. We need to work on an understanding of what the founders meant with the Second Amendment and maybe we can have a conversation about what a well-regulated militia really is and how it should function. So I am going. I am in favor of this change, this ordinance, whatever it is. We're doing. <laughs> these, right. these ordinances. Multiple ordinances. <laughs> right. Well, so, let me go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Scott. So I live at 524 South England. So I'm not the closest person by any means, but I'm still in the neighborhood. Um, I was, think it was my second year of law school. Clay Williamsburg was doing their uh, annual hunt deer control oh, hunt yeah. and I was getting out of the car and walking into the house and I assumed that they were in this area and areas beyond 199 and, and had to have been shotguns because that's all that's allowed. Uh, very faint pops and that's in a totally uncontrolled area um, with you know n no berms, no directional controls <laughs> so you know, it's, it's anecdotal experience at best but it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't at all alarming. Um, I, I, I was not, I was not surprised in any way. Um, also, I, I walk this street at least once a week um, down to the dead end and uh, you've seen the sign there for some time. It's, you know, this, this, this doesn't go without a lot of thought. Um, also, to, to add to Doug's point, you know, I, I don't typically like to approve things without knowing all the details. But I've never seen anything from Colonial Williamsburg as far as the programming goes to say that it's not top quality and uh, truly representative of the experience. And I see this as an opportunity, as Judy pointed out, to really interpret American history in a way that is relevant to today's world. Um, I, uh, as, a, as like a fourth and fifth grader, spent a lot of time at 4-H camp shooting it wasn't it wasn't 18th century but it was uh, kind of more modern uh, muzzle loading rifles so that was impressive as a as a young person so i i can appreciate that experience uh, on today's history i guess i'd like to follow up on both uh, judy and, and, and scott and uh, uh, I, I agree with the comments about the educational mission of Colonial Williamsburg and the quality of what they do. Um, I, I think it would be helpful if, if the um, foundation would be willing to share, as, as this develops, to share with the city and, and more importantly with the community how, how they, they envision sort of the educational part of this going on. I think Ms. Toyda's 
uh, comments were, were uh, uh, important and, and thoughtful about the, 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 the potential here to really create an educational uh, experience that is both fun and educational at the same time. So uh, I, I hope that the foundation, as we go forward, will, will do that. Um, I also, um, thanks to Ms. Shelton, would favor when we get to the special use permit of, of doing that for a specified period of time, say three years, because that would give us time to experience this, to, to see about noise levels, to see about the educational program that goes with it, and then to reevaluate it after some, some uh, experience with it. And I think from a, a, the standpoint of the city, that's probably a wise direction to, to go. Mr. But, Mayor, can I speak on that? Yes, okay. please. This is a significant uh, investment yes, for Colonial in Williamsburg, and to put a time frame on it would actually uh, impact our return on investment. And for us to have a restriction would be a consideration if we move forward with this. I, with this I, I, I fully, fully understand that, but it also would be mean at the end of that period you could reapply for the special use permit and we could consider it in light of the experience. And, and my sense is the experience will be uh, such that uh, a future city council would want to, to uh, uh, renew that special use permit. But, but, but I understand. It would have an impact. I fully understand your, your concern. Okay, thank, you. thank you. And 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 I'm speaking for myself, not for council on this. So we'll have to wait till we get to the motions. Any any further comments? Is not a question, for Chris. We can limit the the length of time the special use permit is 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 good. Um, have, and that, at that point, they would have to reapply. Yes. Is, I mean, I, I don't particularly want to make them go back through a reapplication process. Okay. I would. It would be nice if, in a year, we could have a some sort of conversation. What what can we build in here that allows for that? Then? If council wanted to do something other than limiting the time frame, um, council could put a restriction on it um, that if um, it, that staff could evaluate the could evaluate the special use permit in a year to determine if it constitutes a nuisance my concern about doing that is is how do we measure that um, you can put a condition in the special use permit um, for them to come back in a year and report to you um, that that sort of starts to get out of the actual use of the property, okay. so so that is my concern about that. Yeah, I, I, I think, and, and I'm, I'm not, I'm thinking about sort of a, a length of time, would it make sense or, or not, but um, certainly it doesn't seem to me in, in, in my experience and, and your advice of working with, with special use permits over, over the over the past 15 years, that there, there are a lot of options for us there. Well, it's effectively a zoning category. Yes, exactly. Once you've granted it, you've it's granted it. Granted. So if you yeah. want to limit it, the, the best way to do that is limit it for a period of time. When we start having to get into measures, then it yeah. becomes a factual determination. Okay. okay. I, I don't really think we should do that. I don't think we ought to put a limit on it. I, I think it, if it does become you know, if there's a lot of noise in Port Anne or something, it seems to me if we have other things, other, that, other, other ways, to uh, yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to and, and limiting I, the spend. My, my, my experience with Colonial Williamsburg is that they have been very responsive to right. the community. So if, if issues come up, uh, given their past experience, our right. past experience with that, I would assume they, they would modify and make adjustments right. and, and, and address that. So Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll pull back. Another alternative that the city manager just suggested to me that I think might work is that you grant the special use permit on condition that the decibel readings at a certain point do not exceed X amount. Um, so say for example at a thousand feet it never exceeds 65 decibel levels and that's a condition of zoning again if they violate that condition then they have to take steps to correct that zoning violation that may be one way to, to do what you're trying to do without imposing time limit 
I kind of like that. I mean, yeah. I think we all have. Uh, I'm gathering there's a sense of, of liking what we've seen based on this information, and, and the decibel levels are within those parameters. And so, I think if they, to, to Ms. Shelton's point, uh, if they go over, then then we might have more cause for concern, and so that could be tested down the road. Uh, and, and that would be a condition of the special use permit. That would use be a permit. condition of the special use permit. Yeah. And, of course, if they violate that, they're in violation of the zoning permits. Tony, does that That's seem okay. yeah. That would Scott, does that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, just so long as we're, we have some good information when we pick a decibel there. Because yeah. You see that? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think, again, our, our noise ordinance provides a decibel level. Yeah. It seems to me to be something we yeah. refer to. Already meeting. Yes, already exactly. Meeting. And, and um, so that having having that, you know, then it, it doesn't violate the noise ordinance. And maybe, maybe Ms. Shelton can help us with. Um, we're, we're talking about sort of if we did that, say, at 1,000 feet at a particular decibel level, would you recommend the decibel level that's in our noise ordinance is not exceeding that? Well, it, the, the, there is an exception in the noise ordinance for the for, legal discharge of right. firearms. This would effectively reimpose that, that at a certain distance, distance, but it would be a zoning violation as opposed to a noise ordinance violation. But I, I guess my correct. We, we could pick any decibel level, but it would be arbitrary to do anything. To me, it seems arbitrary to pick what we, in our ordinances, say is an acceptable noise. I, I think you're, okay. you're probably correct. Okay. Okay. Any further? And, and I think that you may want to ask Ms. Murphy a question regarding the distance, if she knows it or if Mr. Nestor knows it, between the firing range and the residential properties, so you make sure that that measurement is shorter than that distance. Yes. So do, go back to, to the, the test sites, what, what were the distances to, seems to me test site one was... That was 500 feet. Yeah, yeah do, you, do you have those distances? Yes, right. Uh, <coughs> test site one was 500 feet, test site four, was 1,080 feet. So 1,000 feet would put us with a circle uh, to test flight four. Yeah. It's reasonable to me. Yeah. Okay, and, and uh, I believe we could do the first three of the rezonings as one motion yes. and then the special use permit as a second yes. motion with, with the stipulation that... With the additional condition. Condition that... Uh, at a thousand feet, uh, not at TC. Yeah. What is the noise ordinance? Sixty-five decibel. Yeah. Okay. Decibels, right? Mr. Foster, would you like to make a motion? Do I need? Do I need to have that specific language in the? In the. Uh, well, if we do the first the, three, I'll do the first three, then we'll figure out. The <laughs> okay. <last>. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, I move we approve proposed ordinance 15-15, 15-16, and 15-17. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Ms. Walton? Ms. Newton. Aye. Mr. Pons. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Abstain. Mr. Foster. Aye. I can't get my. I can't get my. I, I think you could just propose here. to. Um, to I can do it. Oh, okay. I got it. Um, Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the request of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation for a special use permit to construct a shooting range for authentic and or replica 18th century firearms at 640 South England Street as recommended by the Planning Commission. I also move that they cannot exceed 65 decibels at 1,000 feet. Does that, does that do it for you? As a condition of special, 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 special use permit. I move to approve as amended. Mm -hmm. I'll, I move to approve as amended. Yeah. So we have a motion and a second. Um, do we have a second? Uh, oh, sorry. I'm making the second. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Jerry? Aye. 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 Abstain. Mr. Foster. Aye. Uh, I want to thank everyone who participated in the open. Uh, in, in the public hearing today, this was a very good process, and we really appreciate your, your uh, attention to this, and we look forward to uh, uh, 
a very successful operation from Colonial Williamsburg. So thank you very much. Our next order of business today are reports, uh, first monthly financial statements. Uh, Mr. Collins, anything in particular? Uh, they're submitted for your review and staff's available. If you have any questions, I, I would point out, as is tradition, that we're four months running with um, the hotel and meal tax, the room tax and meal tax, both showing an increase. That's uh, four months straight. Any questions on the financial statements? Not uh, monthly department operating reports. Anything in particular? We're available if you have questions. Anybody have any questions on that? Uh, city manager reports, we have three today. Uh, the first is a fire department uh, rescue pumper replacement. Chief. Welcome, Chief Dan. Thank you. Mayor Holman, members of City Council, as you know, the City's 2015-2016 Goals, Initiatives, and Outcomes and the Vehicle Replacement Plan call for the purchase of a new rescue pumper to replace the existing Squad 10. The Squad 10 is a 1994 Sutphin rescue pumper, as you see pictured here. The new squad will be a 2016 Pierce uh, Velocity rescue pumper. Uh, we took, there were several factors that were considered in looking at replacing this piece of apparatus. Uh, one of the things, first and foremost, is 21 years of age. Uh, the National uh, Fire Protection Association recommends that any apparatus 15 years of age or older be moved to a reserve status, and at 20 years or older, it be removed from the fleet. So we're trying to follow that NFPA recommendation. Also, another thing that was taken into consideration was our personnel safety. Uh, this may be a little difficult to see, but this is the cab of our current squad. As you can see, this is this is the step to get in the squad, and this vehicle has uh, limited space in the cab for the officer's position and for the driver's position. Um, this was customary for the 1994 era. Also, you'll see the jump seat. This is the door to enter the jump seat behind the driver. There is another seat to fold down here for for another firefighter, so you can see the limited capacity that they have. And also, that was common uh, in that era was. Uh, this is the, where the engine was mounted, so it's a really, really limited space uh, for firefighters to ride. And the way the S SCBA is mounted, um, it's right in the center of their back piece. Now, in new apparatus, that, ap that SCBA is recessed in the seat. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, with the new apparatus, there's additional space in the cab and the jump seat for the driver and for the riders. They also provide now a front impact and side impact protection for uh, everyone on the apparatus. It also has an electronic stability control, and what that does, it, it gauges a threshold where there might be a spin out or there might be a rollover of that piece of apparatus, and it automatically applies the brakes and automatically reduces the RPM. So it's another built in safety measure for personnel on the apparatus. One of the issues we've had with this piece of apparatus is over the years, um, the necessary equipment that we need to carry for different types of incidents has increased. So as you can see, this is just one compartment on this piece of apparatus. We have limited space. We actually personnel at the fire station had to go in and make some uh, brackets here to carry struts for vehicle stabilization. Um, as you can see, the cord reel up here, those struts actually go behind the cord reel. This piece of apparatus was just really designed with a lot of limited space. Again, here, some creative storage. Uh, again, additional struts added to um, this vehicle over the years. And this is actually inside of one of the compartment doors where we went in and made some alterations to store the additional equipment that we were required to carry. A couple other things that uh, we took into consideration with some obsolete components. Um, also, we're concerned about at over a period of time, 21 years, that the chassis is beginning to weaken, uh, structural stability is weakening, but weakening because of the amount of equipment that we carry and the weight of that equipment. Also, with some of the major components, um, we're, we're concerned about uh, expense there. A couple years ago, we've already had to replace a pump shaft in this piece of apparatus, which was an expensive repair. 
and also the availability of the parts. The parts are becoming limited, so when we do when we do have an issue, um, it increases our downtime for this piece of apparatus. So this is this is a similar chassis. I was fortunate to find a white one, so it doesn't have our striping. But this is the chassis. Um, this is very similar to what um, we're proposing for purchase. Again, it's the 2016 Pierce Velocity Rescue Pumper. And what differentiates this pumper from a standard pumper is some, all that additional equipment that we've talked about. Um, and we carry that for response to incidents such as vehicle accidents, uh, construction accidents, structural collapses. So we have all that extra equipment to carry with us. Some of that additional equipment, um, this is our uh, Hamatro hydraulic tools. Um, whether we're working on a vehicle, um, it could be, again, it could be in some type of collapse situation. So we carry this type of uh, equipment. We also carry stabiliz the struts I showed earlier for vehicle stabilization. Again, that can also be if we're in a, in a construction site or uh, a building collapse, you may have to shore up certain portions of the building to make a rescue for a victim. Also airbags, we carry these airbags. If we had a, a situation where a vehicle was on top of another vehicle or, or unfortunately if it was on top of a person, we have the ability to, we carry different size airbags, we have the ability to raise that vehicle to remove um, off of another vehicle or remove that person from the vehicle. Another big key for us with this piece of, this rescue pumper, uh, this is an SCBA fill station. And what that, that fill station gives us the flexibility of filling our breathing air cylinders at the scene of an incident, which uh, we don't have any other way. We carry some extra cylinders, but if we went beyond those extra cylinders, we would need this system here to refill cylinders so we can continue to work. So as you can see, that takes up some of uh, a good portion of one compartment there just to have that uh, SCBA fill station. This new rescue pumper, it was proposed to be purchased under a cooperative purchase contract through the city of Suffolk, Virginia. Uh, staff did a lot of work in researching uh, what was the best fit for Williamsburg, and they determined the bid awarded to Atlantic Emergency Solutions was competitive, uh, and we worked with Atlantic to make changes in the specifications that uh, fit Williamsburg's needs, and that's for a contract price of $723,392. That price also reflects a $27,076 discount for a 90% prepayment at the time of order, which we've, uh, when we purchased the engine in 2010, that was the first time we did the 90% prepayment, uh, but it's worked out really well for us by receiving that discount. Also, Pierce Manufacturing and Atlantic Emergency Solutions will provide training to all of our personnel. Atlantic Emergency Solutions also opened a full service maintenance facility in York County, uh, which gives us quick access to service if we need it. And they also have mobile technicians that are able to come out on site if we require repairs on site. Another cost that you saw uh, associated with this uh, purchase, this equipment here is our current extrication equipment. Uh, this equipment that we have on the unit now was purchased at the same time the engine was purchased in 1994. <clears throat> so this was a 2000 series. Uh, they call it, Hamatro called it their 2000 series. They're now up to a 5000 series. And what the reason they continue to change, obviously they want you to buy the newer equipment, but one of the things that's really driven this is the auto manufacturing processes have increased the amount of high strength metal alloys and comp composite materials that they use. So it's become difficult for that, more difficult for that 2000 series uh, cutter and spreader that we have to actually bend or move or cut these, this material that's being used in the vehicles now. As indicated in your memo, the cost of this equipment is $43,376. That includes the cutter, the spreader, the power unit, all the hoses that go with it. Uh, with that, we were able to secure a grant through the Rescue Squad Assistance Fund that will pay for 50% of this purchase. So that brings the total cost of the rescue pumper to $745,080. The funding for this pumper was budgeted in the city's vehicle replacement plan for 2016 at $750,000. If approved, the current Squad 10 will be removed from service and they'll either be traded in or sold at, uh, 
fair market value, whichever brings the most return to the city. We've already had um, through some of we've had sold one outright before, uh, and we've had some of those smaller organizations requesting um, to, to know a price on it. But obviously, we didn't move forward until we have approval to move forward with a new purchase. And the reason I stand before you today with this purchase is um, from the time of order, it takes approximately 270 to 300 days uh, for delivery of this pizza apparatus, which puts us another year, uh, almost another year into the current squad 10 that we have. So we would be at 22 years of age um, with the current squad 10 that we have. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Chief Ted, thank you very much. That's a very thorough presentation. Uh, uh, let me turn to council for any questions. Chief Dent, when you buy a vehicle, it's, it's a good one. Um, it hasn't been that long since you were up here before and I'm seeking another replacement. This is a lot of money. I mean, it's a significant uh, expense. But when you think about the people who use this equipment every day, the professional firefighters, the volunteer firefighters, and the people of this community that they're serving and the needs of any one individual at that time when a, f a few seconds or a minute or two minutes or that extra canister of air or the ability to uh, you know, cut through a car a little more quickly than you could have with the old equipment can save somebody's life. I don't think anybody's going to argue that we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be providing the best possible equipment that we can afford. Now that said, is there any functionality in this uh, velocity pumper or in the spreader or cutter that you feel you wanted but we couldn't afford? No, sir. We 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 asked. Uh, we there's we have a committee that did a lot of research on on all of the equipment, the pumper, um, and and you bring up a good point. It wasn't that long ago that that we purchased a new pumper, but to keep that rotation and try to extend the life of what we have now. Uh, that's another important reason that that we need to move. We're asking to move forward with this, uh, but there was there was not anything that fortunately with the you know we might have been outside of our seven hundred fifty thousand dollars if we were if we didn't obtain the fifty percent funding for the other equipment. Uh, but with that, we we have not um, we have not cut our specification short or our equipment short based on the amount of funding that we have. And one other point that's worth keeping in mind is this piece of equipment is not only going to serve just the citizens of Williamsburg, but with our mutual aid agreements, we're responding in York County, we're responding in James City County, just as they're helping us out when that's necessary. And I think to, uh, to keep up the quality of equipment throughout the three jurisdictions is, is particularly important and uh, I think a good show of faith to the other jurisdictions. I'm a little concerned though when you talk about either using it as a trade-in or selling it. You cited the fact that uh, it should be, according to the National Fire uh, Protection Association, it should go to reserve at 15 years or be retired at 20, and we're thinking about selling it to somebody else who's going to use it at 22 years? Yes, sir, and that's, well, we, all, we offer that. As you know, there's a large portion of the state of Virginia that is uh, still volunteer contingent, and they may, their localities may, may not have the funding to purchase new apparatus, so they often look to um, purchase used apparatus, um, not just to add to their fleet, but sometimes it may be to add a reserve piece to their fleet, um, just to, so they have additional equipment. Um, we, The last piece we sold to a volunteer organization, um, the, the first two days they had it in service. They did some a little bit of refurb to it, painted it for their, for their colors and striping, and the first two days it was in service, they fought two structure fires with it, um, which was very, very uncommon for them. So a lot of those jurisdictions don't respond to the number of calls that we respond to. And as you know, if we follow every NFPA standard that's out there, it's extremely expensive um, to follow every standard out there. So not every organization can follow every standard or recommendation from NFPA. So when we make the decision about the trade-in or the sale, is it purely economical or do we take into consideration if we're within a certain ballpark and there's a community that can really use a piece of equipment like this, we would go that direction as opposed to trading it back into the manufacturer? Yes, sir. Obviously, the, the manufacturer, some, you know, the price. And, and what they do a lot is they have a specific dealer that they work with and they take it on trade-in and then that dealer ends up selling it and making, it, making some money off of it to so maybe the same volunteer organization that we were going to sell it to. 
and this is I guess a question for the city manager when we if we if we uh, get a greater trade in we obviously spend less so we not as much money comes out of the capital fund if we sell a piece of equipment like this after the fact that money just goes back into the capital fund e either way they get to, this, you yeah. know, get to the same place trade okay. trade in value reduces the value means we spend less the money remains there and the other way it comes back it goes there as well okay. it's a general fund those are my questions sir. Scott 22 years pretty good life for something that gets used every day multiple times a day and that we really depend on um, it's uh, you know seven hundred fifty thousand dollars is never taken lightly but let's hope we have as good a luck out of this one <clears throat> And I think it's a testament to how we take care of our equipment. Yeah. The, the, the staff takes care, care of the equipment. And, and I certainly wouldn't be standing before you today if, if I didn't feel it was needed and I realized yeah. the amount of money uh, that it is. If I may also, a question regarding one recently being purchased. It's very common right now for jurisdictions across the country to have deferred large capital purchases like this coming through the recession. And now as economies and, and funding starts to recover, it, you'll see more and more jurisdictions prioritize their capital needs, and, and you'll see public safety needs obviously coming, coming to the, the forefront. And so you'll, you'll see more of these purchases. At the same time, those, those volunteer and smaller departments have, have deferred their expenses, and, and some of those lag behind in, in economic ability. So providing still relevant, usable equipment for their purchases is meaningful as well. I don't have any questions. Me neither. Um, thank you, Chief Dent. That was a very, very good presentation. Um, any further comments? If not, I'll take a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move the City Council authorize the City Manager to purchase a new replacement rescue pumper, spreader, and cutter extraction tool for a total purchase price of seven hundred and forty-five thousand and eighty dollars. Second. I have a motion and a second. Jerry, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Aye. Mr. Pons. Aye. Mr. Mayor Aye. Mr. Aye. Our next uh, city manager report is acceptance of primary extension paving funds. This is proposed resolution 15-10. Dan, welcome. Thank you. Mayor, City Council. Uh, last month I mentioned that we had received word that we had were approved for some VDOT paving funds. And I'll be back this month to, for you folks to uh, hopefully take action. Uh, this is a new funding program. Uh, it's called the Primary Extension Paving Funds. It allows localities to apply for funding of primary roads that are located in the, in the locality. Uh, these are the roads that are typically the uh, carry state route numbers, for example, our Route 60, our Route 143, 132. Um, we were approved for $607,000, which will pay Richmond Road <clears throat> from High Street to the corporate limits, a uh, distance of about a mile and a half. Uh, this will be paid 100% from VDOT, uh, no, no local match or any contribution from the city at all. Um, and just uh, VDOT requires a resolution from the governing body accepting the allocation and granting authority to the city manager to execute any documents necessary to facilitate the program. Uh, this work will take place in the spring, early summer, in conjunction with our normal annual paving program. So you have before you resolution number 1512 for action. And thank you. And you, you talked about this earlier. So any, any questions on this? No, sir. Dan, was this portion of uh, Richmond Road on the NRCIP to, to do um, in the next five years? Yes, this, we paid this last in 2003, so it's been 12 years. It's due. And so we've been allocating funds to do that, so that clearly they, these will free up funds. Um, yes, we also also have some revenue sharing money coming in next year for paving, right. so we're actually going to be spending 500000 city money, 500,000 of revenue sharing money and then the 600,000. So we'll have a big, a big payment here for next year. So this may, may provide opportunities to do some of the other areas that, that are further down the road that really need it. We're making up our list for next year right now. We're getting it together. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Pleasure. Anything else? If not, I'll take a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move the council approve resolution 15-10 to accept the funds and authorize the city manager to execute all necessary documents relative to carrying out the primary extension paving program. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Jim? Ms. Newton. Aye. Mr. Pons. Aye. Mayor Holman. Aye. Vice Mayor Pryland. Aye. Mr. Foster. Aye. Uh, 
Next is the tourism promotion contingency funding process. This is a process we talked about uh, for a variety of times and, and I think have reached a uh, conclusion about a process. Uh, is Jody, are you going to do this? Jody, Good afternoon, you. Mayor, members of City Council. As the Mayor mentioned, at the July meeting, uh, Council requested that staff propose a process and criteria for re reviewing and evaluating funding requests for the city's tourism pro promotion contingency. Uh, this fund was created in FY15 to provide one-time funding for projects and activities which drive repeat overnight visitation to the city. To date, seven requests have been funded. The following process is recommended to review and evaluate um, requests when received by the city. Uh, first, looking at your memo, first step would be that the request should be submitted in writing to the city manager's office for initial review. Um, in, in the request, information providing details on the project or activity and how advan it advances the city's goal to drive overnight visitation uh, will be reviewed. Uh, second, uh, uh, part of the process would be a staff committee review. Uh, we would take a look at the request and provide a recommendation for city council's uh, consideration. Uh, the recommendation from staff would be based on the following proposed criteria. First, is this a new project or activity or does it add something new to an existing project or activity? Uh, does the project or activity drive overnight visitation? What is the possible return on investment on the project or activity? Does it complement or add to existing tourism products or activities currently in the city? Um, is the applicant willing to provide marketing information, attendance data, and return on investment data at the conclusion of the activity or project? And will the city be listed as a sponsor of the project or activity? City Council will review the request and the staff recommendation at the next monthly council meeting. And at that point, we'll make a funding decision based on the information provided. Finally, once a decision is made, staff will notify the applicants of the decision and ensure that any follow-up actions um, need to take place, including any required reporting happens. So this information has been provided to you today for further discussion and consideration. Thank, thank you, Jody. Thank you for all your, your work on this as well. Any comments, questions, Paul? I have a question. Ms. Miller, I, I guess I should have realized this before, but it's, for some reason this is the first time it struck me that the Tourism uh, Promotion Contingency Fund is one-time funding. So that once we've provided uh, a grant or some level of assistance to a particular organization, I would assume for a particular discrete project, yes. that that project then is no longer eligible the way it's designed for funding. Right now, yes. But that doesn't mean that um, if there's an organization that does one thing and it's successful and then they come back and they want to do something completely different, they could still apply for right. that. Well, the same or, organization but different activities. Or they might want to expand what they did and that would still be yes. eligible. Yep. Oh, that starts to get into a gray area. Right. But, because that, And the reason I say that is everybody wants to expand their event. If you say we're going to try to draw 500 people this year and next year we want to draw 700 people, yeah, but it, you know, the wording says add something new to an existing. So, so, no, uh, and and I think that's where we would rely on staff to make a recommendation. Is this really new? When you, what is right, it? but it doesn't say that where it says provide one-time funding. Well, the I mean, it's it's explicit in the front where it says create in fiscal year 15. I'm I'm reading in the definition of what we're talking about on the process. It says one-time funding. Well, so I'm, I want to understand what the parameters are. I, I think that, that one time refers to the fact that we set aside the $250,000 one time to do that. That so, doesn't mean one time for. Okay, well, that was my question. Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't mean that. Well, but, but also, I don't think the expectation is we continue to fund the same activity year after year after year. If the if organization wanted to come and have an activity or project funded, they would need to show us how it was different, how it added something new or unique that really drove overnight visitation. An example of this would be the arts festival um, that recently we approved. That they're, they, they're adding additional days to that. They're bringing in uh, high-quality high national um, performances, those types of things, rose to the level of being new, different, adding to an existing. Is this a, a policy issue for discussion? Uh, grants prog programs can be based either 
or or and. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've seen grant funding set up for special events that are done in the annual budget process. They can be for ongoing operating expenses on demonstrated economic impacts within the community. I've, I've also seen it where you set it up much like this uh, was intended um, to, to be a, a one time to, to grow and expand but not to be a sustainable operation but that and it's for expanding and growing the pie within the city and, and that's the point I'm trying to understand because if, if we are we saying that if you get funding and I'm not arguing one with the other I'm just trying to understand so the applicant understands because you want, you want when we have a process like this the most important thing is everybody understands how the level of the playing field so if and it, I'm looking at us is this our intention that if somebody creates a festival and I don't want to pick one in particular because it sounds like I'm singling somebody out. But let's say that they create a, a Valentine's Day festival to bring people in February. And that's new, so that's eligible. And the next year, they want to have a longer Valentine's Day festival that goes an entire weekend. Then that's bigger, so they can come back and request the funding again. They, they could. That, that doesn't mean they'll receive it. And the it, next year, they, they, want, they want to grow that two-day festival from 300 people to 500 people. Uh, you know, do you see where I'm, I'm going? Yeah, and, but I, th I think that's that's a discretion that I would like council to have, rather than in in the, the in the in the criteria say, no, you you can't do that. Because if somebody does something that's very successful, and then they come back and say, this was successful, but we think we can even be more successful by adding this, then I would like to be able to consider that. If we just make it one time blank, then you couldn't consider that. Well, but you you can consider that if it gets to you. I'm sorry. Consider what? If, if it gets. Well, but it's only going to get to us if we say for a, a new or an expansion of an existing. I mean, all an expansion of your Valentine thing could be adding a concert. You know, it, it was it was one day they did something, and the next year they want to add a concert. So that's. So all I'm saying is we're leaving it very wide open. Yeah, and, I, and that's fine if that's what you yeah. want to do, but then we've got to be prepared to communicate to people who apply and don't get the funding because there are going to be times when we say no. Sure. So, yeah. Why, even though I'm expanding my festival, do you not want to support me? And, uh, so as long as we have that will, that's fine. I just want to make sure we're clear on all that going in. I almost think a lot of this discussion is, is unnecessary. We still haven't figured out if we're going to continue to fund that's this, right. this grant program. <laughs> we're, we're talking about a few dollars. Um, I, I, I think that's the question for the next budget round, sure. is, is do we want to, to do this? We did it as a one-time funding. I, it seems to me it's been very successful mm -hmm. so far. Um, I, I would hope that in the next budget round, we, that will be on the table as something either to continue it for one time again or to make it a permanent part of the budget. And, sure. and that seems to me, you know, we're, we've gained now almost a quick almost two years of experience working with this. So it seems to me, you know, one of the things in the retreat we could talk about is where does this fit in our next budget discussion? Sure. And I think that's the policy that we have before us. Yeah. Um, and, and I just foresee us having this discussion about how we evaluate programs that come to us after we, again, after we have this, this further discussion as to how we create the fund. Uh, because I can see, you know, why don't we establish a committee, in it, and I think maybe to add to this proposal, you know, shouldn't there be a member of council on there? I think so. Or maybe even some tourism professionals. Why not? Um, and so I think there's, there's lots of questions that we can ask about the task force that's assembled to look at this, but then why don't we have this task force also look at all the tourism funding? You know, maybe maybe if we spend 1.2 million dollars today at CW and, and another 750 at the chamber, maybe maybe those fall under the purview of this task force to evaluate programs. So, I I think we we have a whole lot more discussion to do amongst council and, and, and to your point about the work session, that might be the opportunity to do it. But for the purpose of what's remaining in this, the, what was 250 thousand dollars, this seems adequate. Well, and my question to you, Mr. Mayor, is, and, and I don't disagree with you that what we've done so far is we, we feel has been successful, but how do we know that? Well, that that's and why this has criteria in it that, that asks for right. measures. Yeah, and, you know, think about the Arts Commission. 
and the Arts Commission we, is engaged to, to dole out funds for different programs, and, and maybe that's kind of where we're heading in, in some of this, in my mind, is, you know, how, maybe we have an Arts Commission, or a Tourism Commission that helps us understand where the opportunities are, and, and, and we rely on their experiences. And, and well, but, but you're, you're talking, I mean, scale here, you know, $50,000 to the symphony I, as opposed to well, hundreds of thousands. I only, to, only, only relate that to it, because here's where I think we're going to have well, a conflict I, as yeah. we move forward, and, and once we put more money into this program. And, so and the, the, one of the questions is, is this the role of city council, or does and city council want to hand it off to somebody else, yeah. which I think is a, a, an important yeah. policy that's exactly discussion my point to have. About, yeah. you know, relating this to the Arts Commission, you know, um, and, and the other millions of dollars that we spend on tourism promotion. I mean, we, there, there's just a big can of worms here, and so, again, well, but, but for this purpose, this is a small can of worms yeah, right. that, well, that, that we can but it, deal it with. But brings, it brings up other discussion points, and uh, right. so. Speaking to this memorandum, Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I think this council works well when we have discretion, and this builds that in there. Um, but folks come back and know that this this fund is meant to help people expand and grow and create new things. Uh, it's not a it's not a continuing operational budget uh, line item. So um, I'm comfortable with that council. And I, th I think this is pretty clear right. of that's exactly the purpose of it. And, and, and thank you for bringing the discussion back. I mean, obviously I objected last two, two discussions about this because of the way it was written and that staff would make the determination uh, in consultation. And this kind of changes around where they make a recommendation and then we can make the determination. So I'm comfortable with it. May I ask council to make one slight amendment to this okay. in paragraph three at the end? by majority vote of council. So you know what the process is for approving it when we get to a decision point. Uh, sure. Yeah. So it's not a polling type. That's right. Thing, which was a this is this is your your policy, but I would ask yeah. you to make that clarification. Yeah. Is that everybody comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. With that I'll take a motion. Do it. Is there a motion? Do, do we need to approve this? As, uh, um, you can just approve it as as amended. With, approve as with with a, with, that, with a motion. With that, yeah, with, right. yeah. <coughs> so if somebody would like to make a motion, can, can I just say one thing? Yeah. I, I know you, you get tired of me saying this, but I, I just feel like the in, I, if the as long as the first paragraph is not part of it, because I just think that sentence it says tourism promotion contingency fund was created in FY15 to provide one-time funding to projects and activities what, what, what if we what if we said the one-time tourism promotion contingency fund was then created that, 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 I feel more one time before the contingency fund rather than that because that's the real meaning of that yeah so and, and that's and that was what my initial yeah, question was I, I understand is that, is that acceptable to everybody? Well, and then I would like to add, if we can remove drive them, <laughs> sorry, to, to increase. I think that's what we're talking about is increasing, and we mentioned that at staff meeting the other day. Um, I'd rather be increased. I, there's just discussion at WADMAC today that says, well, WADMAC's not really designed to increase. It's only to drive, and we're splitting hairs. But if we're going to split hairs, let's let's put in increase. Because so this is on the second point. bullet? Yeah. 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 I have no problem. I think they are. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. Got all those changes? Yeah. Can we vote? Or do we take a poll? <laughs> <laughs> Please vote. Let's have, let's have a motion and then we can vote and take a poll. Mr. Mayor, move we approve the tourism promotion contingency, contingency funding process as amended. Second. I have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Chair? Ms. Newsom. Aye. Mr. Hans. Aye. Mayor Hall. Aye. Vice Mayor Carlin. Aye. Mr. Foster. Aye. Next order of business is city attorney <coughs> reports, and we have three. Um, Mr. Mayor, the first matter um, on the agenda is an uh, amendment that needs to be made to the city code. Uh, since council has approved the special use permit, um, firing a firearm with a projectile is currently not permitted under the city code, and there are only limited exceptions when uh, limited exceptions to that. 
The current exception for Colonial Williamsburg allows the firing of firearms for, as part of the historical interpretation in the historic area without projectiles. And so we need to amend when firearms allow, are allowed to be fired under the circumstance. And so Section 10-123 of the City Code contains that exception. You have a proposed ordinance 1518 in front of you, which adds language to permit the firing range to actually shoot projectiles um, and for that activity to be conducted in the museum support district. And so the staff recommendation is having now approved a special use permit that council also approved 15-18. Any, any questions from the city attorney? Okay. I'll not take a motion. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that the council approve Proposed ordinance 15-18. Second. I have a motion. A second. Would you call the roll, please, Jerry? Aye. Mr. Pons? Aye. Mayor Hallman? Aye. Vice Mayor Freiland? Abstain. Mr. Foster? Aye. Okay. Next is the hotel guest registry searches. This is proposed ordinance 15-19. Ms. Shelton? The next two matters are ones that I mentioned last month when I went through uh, changes uh, adopted by the General Assembly and uh, mentioned this toward the end of that presentation. Council recently um, amended the hotel regulations and in those amendments we continued the inspection of the hotel guest registry as a requirement that was punishable as a class one misdemeanor if the hotel owner did not allow us to look at the registry as required. Um, since then, uh, the decision was issued by the Supreme Court in City of Los Angeles versus Patel, and effectively what that did was say that hotel guest registries, the owner of a hotel has a privacy interest in the hotel guest registry, that hotels are not closely regulated industry that constitute an exception to the search and seizure requirements under the Constitution. And so that means that we cannot criminalize an owner who does not allow us to look at the registry, that activity is not criminalized, and that we have to get a warrant if the owner refuses consent. And so I have done two things um, in the amendment that is before council today. I have moved the enforcement and inspections provision out of those areas, those provisions of the code that contain a, a misdemeanor penalty, and I have added language that mirrors the language in the fire code regarding obtaining warrants. So if the owner does not give consent to look at the hotel guest registry, then the inspector who is going to look can go to the magistrate and obtain a warrant, provided there's probable cause that there's a criminal offense um, and that's evidence of the offense or there's a criminal, they're, they're seeking evidence or it is evidence. And so based on that, I would request that council adopt proposed ordinance 1519. Any, any questions for the city attorney? I mean, I don't think we have. Yeah, I just have a question. Here, just right? so I understand this better. Um, obtaining a warrant requires the authorized city official to have probable cause that a violation of the law. Is that a criminal law? Yes. So if, um, if the issue in question is that uh, occupants of a, and I mean, I think this date goes back to the issue about um, the length of stay mm -hmm. and what the registry can prove. Violation of length of stay is not a criminal offense, is it? Um, the, the code provides that the length of stay is for 30 days, and it is included in the list of things for which a criminal misdemeanor. So the hotel owner can only allow someone to stay for 30 days. So violation of that yes. is a misdemeanor yes. offense. Okay, that, that's what I didn't understand. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I'll take a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move we adopt proposal ordinance 15-19. Second. I have a motion. A second. Would you call the roll, please, Chair? Ms. Newsom. Aye. Mr. Pons. Aye. Mayor Hallman. Aye. Vice Mayor Pollan. Aye. Mr. Foster. Aye. And the final city attorney report is real property tax exemption for spouses of military members killed in action. Um, this is, again, one that I mentioned last year, this, or last month. This is the correction to the property tax exemption. Remember that when we talked about this last year, the exemption only applied if your property was 
valued at or less than the average assessed value of a single family dwelling in your jurisdiction. So if the average assessed value of a single family dwelling in your jurisdiction is $250,000 and your property is worth $260,000, you are not entitled to any portion of the exemption. That is not what the constitutional amendment said when it was adopted in 2014 and approved by the voters, and so now the General Assembly has gone back to correct that. So now, if your property is worth $300,000 and the average assessed value of property, single-family detached, single-family dwelling in the city of Williamsburg is worth $240,000, you get a tax exemption up to $240,000, and you pay tax on the remaining $60,000. And so what you have in front of you is Proposed Ordinance 1520, which makes those amendments to the city code to come into compliance with the state code and the requirements that were adopted by the General Assembly. There are some technical provisions in there as well regarding how portion, proportional shares are calculated. This is not optional. Council needs to adopt this. Any questions? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think it's important and good that they fix this because the way the prior wording was set up, it made no sense whatsoever. I, I just, I, probably silly to even say this, but I feel at some point we should go back to our representatives in the General Assembly and say, this is wonderful that you do this for the families or spouses of um, people killed in combat, but what does the state do? Why, why do the, does the state choose to have the locality do something in the state, unless the state's stepping up in some way about which I'm unaware? No. Does the state not feel an obligation to these people who've made the same sacrifice? They're going to let us do it. It's, it's just discouraging. And, and then they'll take the, the glory for it. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Okay. So, but I think it's it's good in a community like ours right. to be able to offer, you know. To, oh, sure. Especially service. with all the, I mean, the significant military presence yeah, sure. in the area. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the Council adopt proposed ordinance 15-20 amending section 18-58 of the City Code to provide for real property tax exemption for surviving spouses and military members killed in action. Second. I have a motion, a second. Call the roll, please, Chair. Ms. Newton. Aye. Mr. Pons. Aye. Mayor Palmer. Aye. Vice Mayor Palmer. Aye. Mr. Pons. Aye. Any unfinished business? I, I just so. thought I'd mention that this is our week for ribbon cuttings. Yeah, <laughs> There's yes, another one this afternoon. <laughs> if we get our three for today. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, any new business to come before council? Apparently, three have come up this week. But, <laughs> but you know, I think that's an, but that's an important point that Ms. Knudsen makes because ribbon cuttings are a sign of uh, economic activity, and that's really important to this community. Right. It, it means something to every, every one of us. And one thing I didn't mention when Chief Dent was speaking to us, I think it's easy to overlook. Items like the purchase of that uh, pumper are also important economic development tools because the businesses in this community and the, the ones who consider whether or not they want to locate here need to know that the community is 100% um, behind health, safety, and welfare and protection of private property. And I think uh, you keeping up a strong fleet makes a, an important statement. Anything else? Uh, that brings us to our final agenda item of the day, which is open forum, a time when anyone who wishes to address council on any matter may do so. If you'd like to address council, please come forward and state your name and address. Uh, seeing none, I think that brings us to the end. Mr. Mayor, I move to adjourn. Second. I have a motion to adjourn and a second. Would you call the roll, please, Jerry? Aye. 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 Aye.